So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you some discussions about user-defined conversion operators in C++. And this will help you with the assignment and it also hopefully teach you some other interesting things about C++ and we'll get to see a, an interesting pattern shown here called the decorator pattern and uh, just kind of a little fun example. So here's the program. We're gonna have a, a main program that's going to define several instances of a type called atomic op. And I'll show you what atomic op is in just a second. For sake of uh, discussion at the moment, just imagine atomic op is a wrapper or decorator class that encapsulates some other type with the ability to atomically increment and decrement it. And uh, this will be a real stripped down version from the actual atomic op implementation that I've done in other contexts, but it'll be enough to show the points. So we're going to define ourselves an atomic op called AI for uh, wrapping or decorating an int, and we're going to give it the value 10. We're also going to make another atomic op called AD that encapsulates a double. And notice how atomic op stays the same with respect to double versus int. It's just that we're parameterizing the type. And then down here we come and we increment AI and we decrement AD, and then we go ahead and print the results out. Now, first I'm going to show you what happens if we try to print these results just like this. You'll notice that this code does not work, and that's because there's no conversion from an instance of atomic op into something that that C out knows how to how to print, how to insert into the stream. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and we're going to add a, an explicit cast here, and then that's going to magically cause a conversion operation to take place. And notice, uh, we could also do something like this. We could also say um, int a uh, i i, and then say a i, and that also works as well. And uh, so that should look familiar to you from your assignment because there's something that's very similar to that. And then of course, we could also say double A, D, D, A, D. And uh, then we could go ahead, if you wanted to, just for completeness here, just to show you what it would look like, we could go ahead and then print those values out, of course, because we know that they know how to be printed. We know how, we know the compiler and the uh, IO streams knows how to print out a double and an int, that's pretty easy. Okay, so now let's go take a look at Atomic Op and see what's happening under the hood in order to make all this work. So here's the Atomic Op class. And like I said, this is just a stripped down version, but uh, it'll show the point. So Atomic Op is parameterized by type T. So we're able to take any old type and make it work atomically. And you'll see what that means to work atomically in a second. And uh, down here, you can see we have a constructor that takes a value and it goes ahead and initializes the implementation to the value passed in. If you take a look down here, you can see that the impl is just an instance of the parameter type that's passed to the template. So here's the type. We come down here and we make an instance of type. And then to make this whole thing atomic, we also add a mutex. And this mutex is something that's provided by the standard C++ library as of C++11, and a mutex is short for mutual exclusion, and it's essentially a type that makes it possible to guarantee only one thread of control at a time is able to perform an operation inside one of the methods we're going to provide here. Uh, I'm not going to go through the whole discussion of what atomics are and mutexes are and threads are at the moment. This is just to illustrate one key point, but it's a cool implementation nonetheless. And we make this uh, data member immutable, and I'll show you why we do that in a second. Okay, so up here, now let's go ahead and take a look at some of the different operations. Here's our good old copy constructor, which takes the right-hand side and initializes the impl from it. Nothing surprising here. Here's the assignment operator, and this is where things get interesting. You see this operation and the other ones we see here all use something called a lock guard. And a lock guard is a very useful piece of C++ standard machinery that implements the scoped locking pattern. 
and also, of course, is an embodiment of the resource acquisition is initialization or RAII idiom in C++. So what happens here is we define ourselves a local variable called lock of type lock guard. And lock guard, as you can see, is parameterized by the, by the type of lock, which we have down here. And what we do is when we come into this method, the lock guards constructor automatically acquires the lock. Let's see if we can go, go find that. Here's lock guard. You can see that lock guards constructor stashes away the reference that's passed in here. You can see here's the, the reference data member that's stashed away in the constructor's base member initialization section. And then the constructor acquires the lock. So this is a good example of something known as the decorator pattern from the Gang of Four book. We'll talk about that more later. So at this point, the lock is acquired, and then we go ahead and we assign the left-hand side from the right-hand side, and we return this, return dereference this, and then the destructor for lock guard will automatically go ahead and release the lock. So you can see that the, the lock guard's destructor unlocks the lock. So this is why it's called scope locking. It locks things on the way in, and then it unlocks them on the way out. So if you take a look at things like operator plus plus, which is just a nice overloaded operator, you can see whenever operator plus plus is called, we use our lock guard to acquire the lock. We do the underlying operation. This is why it's a decorator, because we're decorating the plus plus operation. And then it increments the count and returns the incremented count. And the same thing, whoops, the same thing applies for operator minus minus, if we do it right. And uh, so you can see we go ahead and, and decrement this. And uh, that way, we atomically increment and decrement. And of course, there's other ways to atomically increment and decrement in C++. I'm just showing you something to lead up to the real point here, which is we've got ourselves an operator type. So remember, type is whatever we parameterize this with. So it could be int, it could be double, it could be long or short or care or some other type, whatever we want to decorate. And so operator type is what's called a, a user-defined conversion operator. So we're defining the operator here. And this is going to grab the lock and then return the count. And so that, of course, will be atomic. And the point of this is we're able to explicitly kind of cast, I guess you'll say, the result or the value of an atomic op to whatever type this thing is actually in, encapsulating, encap actually decorating, if you will. So if you come back over here then to the main program, you'll see that what we're able to do is create these atomic ops. We can increment them. We can also decrement them. Uh, just for kicks, we can say, you know, minus minus AI. And let's do that a couple times. And, uh, and then what we can do is we can go ahead and print the results. So let me go ahead and run this code for you. And you can see here that um, we start out with 10, we increment it to 11, and then we decrement it twice. And then we go ahead and store these things. And notice that when we do this call here, this ends up calling the user-defined conversion operator, which was this guy. And it'll convert it back into the type that's being expected here. So hopefully that will help you understand a little bit more how user-defined conversion operators work in C++. This particular example uses a template as the way to get the user-defined conversion. So if you take a look here, you can see that we have operator type, but more generally you can say operator bool or operator long or operator int or whatever, and then it'll do the appropriate conversion back into that type. So that's the wrap up of our first discussion here, just to kind of kick things off and help to answer a question that came up on the discussion forum about what do these strange initializations mean in the context of C++. So now you should hopefully know enough about user-defined conversion operators in order to do that. And hopefully you've also learned something interesting about how to define little decorator classes that statically decorate something by using the magic of templates and operator overloading and uh, user-defined conversions in C++.